Hey there, welcome to Money Never Sleeps, a podcast that looks inside the head of entrepreneurs and at what makes them do what they do. I'm Pete Townsend, your co-host of Money Never Sleeps, along with Owen Fitzgerald. This episode of Money Never Sleeps is kindly sponsored by Ireland's fintech and financial services recruitment specialist, Top Tier Recruitment. If you or a colleague need help attracting and retaining great talent for your fintech or financial services company, it is highly advisable that you build a relationship with the team at Top Tier Recruitment as they really know their stuff. You can find them at toptierrecruitment.com and tell them we sent you. This week, we've got another Money Talk special segment where the comeback kid, Owen Fitzgerald, helps me dig into a few of the things that happened in the past week in tech, venture deals, and the topics we generally cover in our day jobs. So let's just get right to it with this week's episode of Money Never Sleeps. Money Never Sleeps, pal. Here we go again. Welcome to Money Never Sleeps. We're recording today from the home studio. And in this Money Talks episode, we're looking at news from this week relevant to us in this big old massive cloud of finance, tech, startups, and enterprise that Owen and I both operate in. And hopefully it's relevant to all of you, our loyal listeners. Owen is this week sitting closer to his still new smelling mic this week. How you doing today, amigo? Good. I am good. Oh, lots of interesting news been going on the last couple of days. So I was looking forward to having this chat. It's been a kind of busy last couple of days, work-wise anyway. So I look forward to the podcast in the evening for a bit of a break. I know. And I, I've just been anticipating this newish kind of thing we're doing and started on Friday. And I actually started collecting links on Friday. <laughs> Um, so if we're recording this Wednesday night, it, you know, so four business days of doing this and came up with way too much material. Um, you know, not as much as a good comedian, but <laughs> <laughs> plenty, we, we could talk, we could talk for a couple of hours on all this stuff, but. And we usually do uh, off stage. <laughs> I, I know, I know. And, um, yeah, that's why money never sleeps, right? That's it. That's it. Okay. Okay. Um, yes. so let's dig in. So the first story this week. Visa, Facebook, and WhatsApp, obviously part of Facebook, link up for peer-to-peer payments and e-commerce, okay? This was in payments.com, P-Y-M-T-S.com on the 15th of June, and a number of other outlets, right? And this was just the one link that uh, that I looked at. The basic gist of it is that Visa is working with Facebook so that consumers can fully use the new payments feature on WhatsApp in Brazil, the global digital payments giant announced on Monday. And this is quoted from the payments.com article. Uh, So now users of WhatsApp, um, obviously owned by Facebook, can send and receive money and also make purchases from small businesses. Um, So beginning this week, users in Brazil will see the payment option on the app, on WhatsApp, and can establish an account by adding their Visa card details. I thought it was interesting that it was just Visa card details and not MasterCard Does anyone use Discover anymore? No, I think that's just an American anyway. Um, To pay for things through WhatsApp. Businesses can receive funds by opening a WhatsApp business account, which I'm expecting you need to pay for. Awesome. Finally, WhatsApp are making money. I remember when WhatsApp first came to Marketo and would have been, I don't know, 2012, 2013, maybe even before that. Um, There there was always that notice of within the next three months, we'll start charging you 99 cents a month to use this. Oh, yeah, I remember that. That was yeah. never going to happen. <laughs> and then Facebook bought them, right? And that, so it was off the charts after that. And, yeah. you know, so much data they now have on all of us, which is scary. Um, one of the interesting things I, I thought, and I know you're kind of looking at this from a different angle, and I'll let you go into that in a second. Um, this is not the normal Visa Rails. Uh, it's Visa Direct that WhatsApp users will be using, unbeknownst to them, which is fine. It's not a big deal. It's the pipes and plumbing behind it. Um, there's tokenization, not the kind that people talk about with regards to DLT and blockchain, uh, but security tokenization, uh, cybersecurity really tokenization, um, which I learned all about from Pete Rose from Tech Enable, who we had back on way back on episode 22. Um, anyway, back to the actual interesting feature of it from a consumer perspective. I know that you looked at some of the other things, the other stats that were going on in terms of number of users in Brazil. Tell me what's going on there. Yeah, do you know what? I, what was really interesting about this was actually that it kind of went under the radar. Um, you know, there wasn't so, I mean, you're talking about, what, 60 million users or something in Brazil? Um, and, like, it's interesting in two ways because, first of all, they have been trying payments through WhatsApp in India for the last two years. It's been in beta testing. There's been a million users. So that was expected to be the first market, but it ran into kind of regulatory pushback 
and it's been kind of delayed there. And you know that was that was going to be their key launch market, 400 million users in India. So the Brazil bit was kind of a bit out of left field; it wasn't necessarily expected in the market. Um, I was just surprised because I mean you're talking about massive volume of users here. Like this is you know mass consumption on day one. This is really really easy kind of rollout of something. And actually, just to I know you talked there about Visa. I'm reading a different article here. Uh, where it says that they're working with da, da, Visa and Mastercard networks, so they're working with okay. Banco de Brazil, New Bank, and uh, and then some of the leading merchant providers over there. So they're effectively cl- cl- uh, connected into everybody. Yeah, Cielo, I think, is the leading payments processor for merchants in Brazil. Did so you say Banco? Did you say Banco de Brazil? Yeah, I have a Banco de Brazil glass globe up on the shelf <laughs> in the home studio here from a deal I did way back in like 2011. I have to take a picture and tweet it out there so I can see. Absolutely. <laughs> I will put it out there that, yes, there, there is living proof that Pete actually did something in the corporate world before all this, right? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, like, I mean, this to me is fascinating because, look, it's obviously WhatsApp. It's, yes, it's linked to Facebook. But, like, it's just a massive volume of users. Everybody uses it. The ease at which people can make payments. Like, if you, if you think about how easy the likes of Revolut have made it to send money between parties, like, we're talking that, uh, you know, a 10x that. Not for me. Let me tell you. Um, My wife doesn't have Revolut. All of the other kind of school moms do. And when they have to pay for something, guess who gets five euro into his Revolut account (laughs) from his wife's um, Bank of Ireland account that I then need to send to someone by putting their mobile number into my contacts and having Revolut then read that. Yeah. And then copying the link out of Revolut after I instruct the payment, putting that in, back into WhatsApp, and then sending it uh, back to my wife so she can send it to the other school mom who's getting the payment, uh, and then the the deal is done. And I'm like, would you just get your own Revolut account? She's like, but Pete, you told me to get N26. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, do you know what? That example specifically proves the, the the real opportunity that WhatsApp have. Everybody has WhatsApp. Everybody uses it. Yeah. It's, you know, it, it's it's not a closed ecosystem in that respect, which is where the challenge is with the likes of Revolut. And we, we'll talk about Revolut later on. But it's the fact that everybody uses it. Everybody uses it to contact people. You know, you're, you're going into the kind of WeChat side of things if you start making payments and doing other things through WhatsApp. And like, I mean, that's massive. You just talk, just shoot the sheer volume of payments that'll be processed uh, if people start using payments in WhatsApp. It's Big time. Like, and then eventually massive. it will all be done, not in uh, the currencies that we all know and love, but in Libra. Well, yeah, I saw, I saw an interesting tweet the other day when, when this was announced, being like, oh, great. So the obvious solution here is WhatsApp buys Libra. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, so they'll just, pay, they'll just pay themselves in another way. I I think it I you know regardless of all the you know the backlash that that may come off of this and oh my god you know they're monetizing WhatsApp I'm like well it's about time right um yeah. you know this is a massive opportunity to start making transaction fees off of information flows yeah. uh, and if you can do it in a secure manner you know and basically copycat WeChat like you said then hell go for it Right. And, you know, the thing is, if you're going to do it in Europe and even obviously now in the U.S. with, um, you know, with money transmitter licenses and those types of things and e-money here in Europe. uh, But Facebook already have that. Facebook have an e-money license in Ireland. Right. So, you know, uh, they've got the pieces in place. So just get on with it. And, yeah, start in a small market. Not that Brazil is a small market. Jesus. But um, start in a a, uh, specific market and then scale from there. And. To see they, how it they, goes. They don't even necessarily have to. I know they have the e-money license. They don't. With this kind of rollout, they don't even have to go near Europe or the, the you know, no, they don't North America because stay out of the you know tighter regulatory environments. Now, I'm not saying that Brazil was loose in any respect, but you know, I mean, like I said, 60 million users. You go, you know, if they can crack it in India and get a rollout there, that's 400 million users. You know, and, and yeah. emerging economies where a lot of people will be on a, you know possibly below the poverty line or very small, large volume, small transactions, you know, um, where people are, you know, are used to send effectively sending currency through their phones or using their phone as, as the, you know, the, the kind of wallet of currency for them. Um, 
I think it's huge. So I was surprised it didn't make more noise. Yeah, I know. I mean, it, it's like I said, there's just so many of these things going on out there. Um, I think this week in Ireland alone, there was like two or three uh, news items that were, you know, somewhat in the same space as this announcement. And, you know, I, I, I'm not surprised it kind of got lost in the shuffle a bit. But um, I would you use it when it comes to market here? I, I, I mean, if, it, if you're talking about it going on, being paid through the Visa or MasterCard networks, you know, and there being the security in place, like, why wouldn't you for the smaller stuff in the same way that I, I could send 10 euro to someone on Revolut? Like, why wouldn't I do the same for WhatsApp? Exactly. Even WhatsApp is a part of my daily life. And that's the thing. It's, a, you know, everyone uses it. It's amazing. I, I like, I still can't get my friends in the US to use it, right? There's one, my buddy Dom, um, who's all by himself now, poor guy in uh, Idaho, his own private Idaho, right? He's, uh, he, he uses WhatsApp and he knows how to use it from a video uh, perspective as well, which was, which was awesome. Of the rest of the guys in Boston, they won't use it. And it's like, I try to get in touch with them on it. And they're like, oh, we don't use that. We use text. I'm like, well, I'm okay to text you, but you want to text me back. Your mobile you know, plan is going to charge you 75 cents per text. Like, okay, well, then stop texting me. It's like, all right, <laughs> how are we going to stay attached? Yeah. Uh, stay in touch. Like, we'll use Facebook. I'm like, oh, Jesus. You know, it's a virtuous circle. Anyway. Oh, anyway, that's okay. That's not news. What's up? I like that. Um, I, I, you know, at the beginning when you brought it up, Owen, I was kind of like, oh, no, not again. But it's actually a really good point about um, where this all should go just to make our lives easier, you know. And if it can be done in a secure ma- manner, like you said, you know, I'm all for it. And look, um, it comes it comes back to that thing that we're seeing more and more of, which is the big tech companies finding ways to provide financial services products, you know, on the on the periphery, but to large volume users. You know, we won't go into detail on it, but obviously Amazon kind of rolled out a line of credit with Goldman Sachs, I think it was this week, and we've seen it before with others. You know, on Apple and Apple Card, like you've ready made customer base who's going to start using this thing purely because you're offering it to them. Exactly. And you don't even know that you're using a financial service. Yeah. Right. And that there's probably regulation behind it as well. That's it's just, staying, it's there and you use it. Out what of would, the bigger regulatory hurdles, you know, of having to go down the, the route of being a bank or any of that sort of stuff. So, Did you see that bank coming out of Eastern Europe in the last couple of weeks? I think it was called Zelf, um, where there's no card. And you can open an account and you need to, to, to have yourself identified, but you can't close the account, right? You, you do get a, a number that you can uh, use for, for paying for things online, but, you know, very integrated with Apple Pay, with um, Android Pay, with everything. And that is just, you know, shout out to Gary Fegan, big shout out to Gary Fegan. He was the guy who sat me down in Edinburgh um, about a year and a half ago and said, Pete, it would be great if your money was just a thing that just happened. Nothing on your phone, no cards in your pockets. It's just, if you thought about it, your money would go where it needs to go. Like, dude, you need a brain chip to do that. He's like, doesn't matter. <laughs> right? Elon so, Musk and uh, his uh, Neuralink or whatever that one is. That'll, yeah, that, that's the next step for him. Yeah, it's the background bank that's just there. Now, it wasn't really a brain chip type of thing. It was something that, you know, it, it just kind of lives in the background and is, you know, I think WhatsApp are getting pretty close to that. You know, WeChat are already there. Yeah. Right. But if WhatsApp take it this far, then uh, I think they'll get there. Okay. Moving right along. Um, this is one that is not a story. Um, so I'm not going to call this, you know, journalism or uh, beat reporting um, by us, but I'm going to at least walk us through this and why I think it's important. Uh, so Arlen Hamilton from Backstage Capital announced just last week that she is starting the Backstage Crowd. Okay, and this is a investment syndicate. Um, the The basic gist of it is that you invest alongside Arlen Hamilton and Backstage to get the access to the best diverse deal flow in VC. Okay, there's a great six part series on the Startup Podcast by Gimlet Media from 2018 on Arlen's story um, as told with and by Amy, Amy Standen, um, and Arlen basically came out of a very low income uh, upbringing um, and but had been inspired at a certain point 
uh, in her formative years uh, to first start a magazine and then to actually become a venture capitalist. And she moved to Silicon Valley and at different stages was sleeping on the floor of airports because that was the most comfortable place to sleep when you don't have a bed to sleep in. So she raised her first $36 million fund finally. Uh, I think it was around 2017, 2018. Um, she spoke at Inspire Fest in 2017 uh, and 2018 here in Ireland, which is Silicon Republic's annual event here in Ireland. Um, basically, what's happening here, Owen, um, is that with this syndicate for accredited investors, um, what they end up putting in is about $1,500 on average into deals put forward by uh, by the backstage crowd in terms of deal flow that they're finding. Now, What's different here is that the media called her first fund the diversity fund, right? Where she supports founders who are non-white um, and non-male, right? Um, and well, and, and a mix of the two, right? But she called her first fund the "It's About Damn Time" fund, right? For someone to stand up and do that, um, and she's got a book that's called "It's About Damn Time," uh, and, and check that out. I haven't read that Just yet. Just motive, yeah. Anyway, why, why I think this is important um, is that I was also listening uh, last week to Beezer Clarkson from Sapphire Ventures um, on the Full Ratchet podcast with Nick Moran um, and got in touch with both of them to tell them how much I love the episode. So Beezer is a partner at Sapphire. Uh, and in 2016, she led the launch of OpenLP, which is an effort to help foster greater understanding in the entrepreneur to LP tech ecosystem. Um, and she's always been very supportive of informing um, general partners of VC funds with everything they need to know in order to raise a fund and all the different tips and tricks because she wants to genuinely make allocations to good GPs, Sapphire are a fund of funds. So in this episode, Nick and Beezer had an exchange on the leanings of VCs to keep funding those that they have funded before COVID-19. Um, for many VCs, it can be quite difficult to do right now to do anything other than that. Fund those that they funded before and top up, go from you know C to Series A, Series A to Series B if they're investing that far. Um, you know, it, with with COVID nineteen, and you have if you have capital to deploy now, it's harder to get to know new founders and their teams to do new deals. So what's going to happen with this? And Nick and Beezer were kind of getting into this, and it was just a short vignette, uh, short snippet during the episode. But if you look at the current overweighting of venture money going to white male founders, um, there's always less money going to non-white, non-male founders, right? So how do you actually do something here if the tendencies of VCs right now that are finding it hard to get to know new founders, to do new deals and make new allocations – and all of their current investments, or the majority of it, just because the demographics of VC, the majority of their existing investments are going to white male founders. We're kind of really narrowing the funnel even more. Finally, you know, just looking at some of the stats here, um, quoting a piece on the Different blog, which uh, was linked to the OpenLP website. Different are U.S. advisor helping investors find diverse venture investments. They said the VC level of the over 4,000 decision-making partners at over 1,500 U.S. venture capital firms, less than 3% are black, uh, and diverse management teams make up only 18% of VC firms. At the startup level, black-led firms receive a dispro disproportionately low share of funding with just over 1% of total vent venture capital. It just, like, like I said, it, if, this, if this change in how people get to know each other is going to make it harder for them to do just that, there will definitely be even less money now going to such a vastly underrepresented demographic. So to turn this all around, it's something, okay? Nick and Bees are both expressed disappointment at the overall situation, and they were kind of getting into some of this a little bit. And they both suggested they were going to look for opportunities to turn the tide. So I'm not saying dive into backstage crowd as well. We're not authorized to do that. This is not investment advice, but at least spread the word if you got a platform to do so. This And this was kind of the point that Nick and Beezer were suggesting that, you know, there is this context to how investor money is being allocated right now um, with the change in how the world is working and with changes with how people interact with each other. Um, let's do what we can um, to think a bit differently about the investments and how we are allocating money. 
Okay, and we talked about this um, two weeks ago, Owen, on the digital due diligence, right? And how you get to know people um, over video rather than that face-to-face, person-to-person exchange. Um, I just thought this one was really interesting. Um, I reached out to Beezer uh, just to say, hey, love the the podcast. It was wonderful that she did actually give me a reply because I reached out to her cold. Um, So that was uh, nice to get a reply back from her. So shout out to Beezer. Um, But yeah, that was uh, something I just wanted to point out. Like I said, you know, we all have different views about what's going on um, in the world over the last, you know, over the last few weeks, uh, especially over the last few months. Um, And I was thinking about a way for for me personally um, to just kind of express myself around this and me talking through uh, this story around Arlen Hamilton. It's just my way to kind of point it out that, listen, there is a way to start affecting some change in the world. Um, And it's not always necessarily going to have to be through making an allocation to the backstage crowd, um, but it is just to start thinking about these kinds of things differently. And that was just, that was my two cents on it. Look, I mean, I'm a big fan of Ireland, actually. I I saw one of her talks at Silicon Republic um, and like her story is incredible. And like, I I think she has a book out. It's about damn time. I think that's only out this week. Actually, I follow her on Twitter. I saw lots of photos kind of going around of it. Um, And look, it's, it's dead right because like we, we know ourselves even personally in terms of like the challenges, if you were to consider trying to raise a fund, even as a first time like um, investor or anything like that, it's challenging because you want yeah. a record and the LPs, they want to know, they want to know you, they want to know that you've worked together as a team. And that's even just as white guys, you know? Yep. So, like, I know. You can't even imagine what it's like, clearly the numbers show how difficult it is, you know, um, for people of color to be trying to raise funds. And I think, look, it's one of these things that I think a lot of a lot of the challenge is that it's people being able to relate to the others, and that's part of the challenge. And it's well, like you, you see this in uh, on the gender side as well, whereby male VCs have a you know a challenge trying to invest in uh, femtech kind of products and things like that because ultimately they don't understand some of the yeah. challenges. So I don't know how you fix that, but like I know that even something like that that actually opens up the market to even smaller accredited investors is a huge plus. And look, I mean, on the back, on the back of all the protests and all the, all the you know, highlighting that's been done of the issues here, there has been a lot of kind of focus on diversifying into um, underrepresented minorities in terms of startups and funds. And you see that there's been a lot of kind of positive noise coming out of the US, especially around that. And long it may it continue, but these are all small ways that you know accredited investors can get involved and try support some of these products because I mean there you know there's bound to be some really strong opportunities out there and the absolutely way that kind of you know makes it open to everybody. Yeah, I, th- um, I think you hit the nail on the head there when you said you know that it's how you relate to people, and I think you know I I've looked at this topic before with folks in terms of how you interview and how you hire people. Right. And that the very basic interview approach that you take is that the, the, the interviewer is trying to find that common ground with a the person they're interviewing. And you're trying to find out if, OK, if this person is 10 years younger than me, can I imagine them in my shoes in 10 years time? Could they be the one that comes in to replace me? Right. And so you're looking for someone just like you. Right. Pattern matching. So I would think that the way to do this is that if you're a VC uh, and you've got, you know, five, six, seven, eight partners or one or two partners, regardless of what you think your natural inclinations are towards trying to get to know founders, trying to project where they're going to go uh, in two to three years time uh, and even beyond that, um, and that, you know, just try to step back from some of your go-to um, strategies in terms of how to get to know folks that may be subconsciously fixed on trying to get to find someone who's like you, right? Um, and just introduce a more objective and structured model. Now, I'm sure there's loads of consultants out there that can tell you exactly how to do that. I'm not one of them. Um, but you know, I think it is an effort can be made to step back for GPs to say, how are we making these decisions? How we are we actually, what are our filters, right? And can our filters change um, so that we become aware of more diverse opportunities? And that's it. It's even like, even if you step back from it and you, like you, you take a, you take purely a commercial, ignore all of the other stuff, like you're ruling out a large majority of a 
market by not looking at these opportunities. Yep. So, like, you know, which, which makes no sense. So even purely under that kind of uh, light, it makes complete sense for people to be kind of broadening their either horizons or the, the companies they're working with, the people that they're part of their investor teams, lots of that. And, and I've seen this big push um, for a lot of VCs trying to get now, like bring on scouts and uh, from minorities now to kind of obviously beef up their understanding of different markets and also in terms of the diversity of their team. It's, you know, it's a diversity of background as well, diversity of thought. So yeah, Big time. Uh, it's all, it's all, I mean, it's all incredibly positive. And Ireland is probably one of the ideal people to kind of lead this charge. Absolutely. Yeah. So I'm a fan. I'm going to keep an eye on it. And I, I don't think I can invest because I am uh, an Irish citizen now as well. So I'd be considered a non-US investor. Um, but you know, if that weren't the case, I would be signing up for the syndicate. Yeah. So, you know, anyway, um, glad we got to go through that. Yeah. We have another story that I think you wanted to talk us through Owen, uh, with regards to what Revolut yeah, uh, it was, uh, talked about this week in the Irish press today. Obviously Revolut has a good presence in Ireland, 200,000 or more customers or more than that possibly, I think actually the last time I checked, um, but they, um, announced their, their, I suppose their open banking element of their account now is open here in Ireland to link up your other bank accounts, which is, uh, I, I believe, the only bank in the country that does that, or that can offer that right now. Yep. Um, and obviously, open banking has been around since, what, January 2018 or something? Um, so it's been a long time coming, but, you know, like, it, it's great. So I've, I'm a Revolut user of a Revolut account, and I was able to go straight in and within, like, two minutes, connect my permanent TSB account. And like I did, I did it. I, you know, I, I, I trust. I have enough trust in Revolut. I don't use it that often. I use it for certain things, but I have enough trust in them. Just that, you know, providing access to my kind of main account from the TSB, I was happy enough to do. But it was incredibly slick. But aside from that, now, like this is a kind of game changer from an Irish market point of view. But probably will be more common in other markets now because, yeah, and it comes back to what we discussed about Revolut a couple of weeks back. It now opens up the market for them because now they have transaction history from me on my main account, and they can use that then to make decisions around credit or other decisions around providing me with other products. Yep, and that was absolutely the challenge getting people to use it as their main account. Well, actually, open banking means they don't have to. I don't need to bank full time. I don't need to get my salary paid into my Revolut account um, because they can access and they have the data to see my kind of as well as credit worthiness and other information from my other accounts. I was thinking about it from the perspective. Well, I think they probably rather have your paycheck, right? But in the long run, having the information about your paycheck, they would naturally make more money on credit products than I think they would on lending your money out overnight. Uh, it's oh yeah, absolutely. Th th that's actually a dangerous assumption because I'm talking through some of this stuff right now on a much bigger basis with uh, my friends at Fund Admin Chain, and I think there's a simulation to do here, <laughs> you know, yeah. <laughs> to see what what would be the average amount um, if they were to expand and be able to actually get, say, thirty percent of their customers in Ireland's paycheck paid in. What could they actually make by lending that money out overnight versus this three, four, five year buildup of information flow in order to build a credit score to be able to provide you confidently with loans um, at a risk to them uh, that was worth uh, the interest that they were earning on it, right? Yeah, I'm getting way too scientific here, bro. <laughs> no, but that, like that, that's the piece because we kind of experienced it with, with Future Finance, obviously, back when I was working there and like we were lending. You know, we didn't need to offer any other products ultimately because we had. 10 year loans to students. So as long as we had, we worked with some of the credit uh, provider, the, you know, the likes of Equifax and these guys to get you know, the credit history on uh, the kind of applicants that we were working with. So we didn't need the bank accounts. We had that kind of credit worthiness and we were able to make our lending decisions on that basis. And the same here. I mean, yeah, obviously you want to build up a large deposit book. If you're aiming to be a bank, you make money on that. It allows you to, you need that kind of buffer. But they can still go out and offer now other products on the back of the information. It's far more valuable now. And that's kind of that that gets them past that bit of needing to have you as a customer, a proper customer. Yeah. Yeah. I, I kind of took a different view and I'll, I'll tell you why. And I am partially biased, right? For, for two reasons. Um, one, I had trouble with Revolut last year. Anyway, the so when you ping me this morning, Owen, and said, let's talk about the Revolut story. Um, I thought it had something to do with Olivia. 
So uh, Olivia is a AI or artificial intelligence assistant, right? That sits on top of your bank accounts and encourages mindful spending and saving. For full transparency, I'm an independent non-executive director for Olivia here in Ireland. They're a U.S. company that launched back in 2017, um, but is scaling into Europe through uh, an Irish franchise and getting uh, and, and launching in Europe through uh, the Irish ecosystem, the Irish domestic economy. Um, and basically, the way it works is that you plug in your bank accounts, and interesting, interestingly enough, it's the same four banks that Revolut are plugged into. So Bank of Ireland, AIB, Ulster Bank, PTSB, and Revolut themselves. So you can get a view across all of your accounts and it is far richer, deeper insights than you would get out of just this, out of Revolut. Um, And Revolut are just basically listing your transactions and perhaps showing you some graphs about where your money is being spent because it's categorizing things and a better user experience um, than your Bank of Ireland or AIB app would, right? Um, But what Olivia does, for example, Olivia found a water leak in one of their users' homes by analyzing the spending that they had uh, on their bills and saying, wait a second, it looks like you're spending way too much on this utility. Um, What's happened here, right? And they found there was actually a water leak was leading to them using more water in their boiler, right? Um, There are, hey, uh, you've been shopping for the last three weeks at this grocery store. Um, we see that you're spending, you know, X. Um, if you switch over to online delivery from this uh, grocery store, you'll save 20%, right? And it's just very intelligent. Since I started using it um, for good back about a month or two ago, I've become very dependent on it. Um, and I'm checking Olivia probably at least once or twice a day to see how the spending is coming through, how it's getting categorized, has these great things about fixed expenses, variable expenses. So anyway, I had a look when you sent the text this morning, Owen, the WhatsApp actually, to be precise, mm-hmm. at the Revolut app, um, and I stopped short of connecting my bank accounts. Now, being pragmatic, you know, totally expect, listen, can I trust Revolut not to screw this up? Probably. But I'm like, I don't really need to go through the hassle of seeing all this information in even another app where I've already got Olivia that's doing everything that that Revolut functionality itself, not the Revolut bank account side, but that Revolut functionality on the information side. I don't need it, right, with Olivia. Um, so th- that was kind of my view on it. No, and it's, it's really interesting because there is a battle going on, you know, the, the kind of personal financial management piece is where a lot of these companies are going to try play, you know, and because look, they have access to the data, they can make it uh, look at it far more efficiently, give you far better information. And I just, I, I suppose, look, it was noteworthy because obviously Revolut are the first one doing the market here in that respect uh, on the bank side. But it's, it just, I suppose it's just, it's the first time now that that opportunity has been opened up here, especially for different players to get into the market because you come across or like you see a lot on the robo advisor side and wealth management stuff uh well in the us especially but hasn't really creeped in here that much yet but obviously with the stuff olivia is doing and then revolute's announcement today there's going to be a lot more now coming down the track so you know i now expect that my bank or whoever can give me that but not only have the information but can can help me manage my finances better in whatever way and make the right suggestions and you know what automatically do that for me based on you know my track record or whatever so it's kind of really interesting space now with that kind of that piece of work that both of them are doing or being able to do now it is and you know I, i'm all for it and in in any way shape or form that helps people um, be more mindful about their spending and i've just i've seen such a big change to my own finances in the last couple of years where i've just become more mindful and i kind of had to do that manually right where i sorted through my bank uh, statement and then downloaded to Excel, right? And sorted things out because my bank wasn't actually supporting anything like that to be able to tell me what my fixed expenses were and how I was spending money. And once I figured all that out, things just started going a lot more smoothly with the ins and outs every month, right? So anyway, I'm, I'm a big fan, you know, great to see this happening. But um, like I said, definitely pulling for Olivia. Shout out to Kelly Early from Silicon Republic. She did a great coverage piece on Olivia earlier this week in her startup, the week series. And we'll put that into the show notes and also reference that in the article she did today 
uh, in Silicon Republic about um, the Revolut launch of the you know of the information service really is what use is. your uh, insider information to get them on the show. You know what? I think that is a wonderful idea. Shout out to Fira Said and Cristiano Oliveira uh, in the U.S. We're going to be talking about that real soon. Great. Okay. You had something else you wanted to mention yeah, or uh, hijinks and tomfoolery from uh, SoftBank. Yeah. Purely even for the, like, it's so funny. It's tragic almost, you know, like SoftBank are like the gift that keeps on giving in terms of like, <laughs> the stories that come out of there. So like this week there, it, it came out that they'd put more than 500 million into credit, credit Suisse investment funds that had made big bets on the debt, of struggling startups backed by SoftBank's vision fund. Yep. But like, how, how does this sort of stuff happen? And like, how does it, especially how, whatever about like SoftBank doing their own thing with their own fund, like clearly there's a lack of governance of sorts going on there anyway. But like, how the hell do they manage to get Credit Suisse involved? And how does a legitimate bank and stuff, like how does this stuff happen? It just, I just thought it was ridiculous. But I know. Surprising, but yeah, just, it's, it's comical. And I know, and Credit Suisse are pushing things through Greensill, who are an investment advisor in the in the UK that are they have some sort of relationship with Credit Suisse. So there is this separation, but when you look way back up to the top, um, it's kind of like you know the AIG involvement credit default swaps back in the financial crisis. Yeah. It was like it's just a circular reference. Yeah. Right. <sighs> Yeah, there's loads of other things that happened yep, with yep. SoftBank this week, but I just feel bad <laughs> slagging on them so much yeah, uh, that well, yeah. I don't want to get into any more of it. There's been I'm a nice person, Owen. I'm a genuinely nice person. <laughs> <laughs> 2020 has obviously given us some awful stories. It's also given us some like outrageously unusual uh, financial services stories. Like the, the other one I want to discuss was in the Times. I was in the Times uh, on Monday, and like I've been following this one for a different reason, but like. Hertz warns investors they're all but certain to be wiped out in share sales. So obviously, Hertz, the car rental company, filed for Chapter 11 bankruptcy in the US. And for like anyone who doesn't understand, Chapter 11 means that they're allowed to effectively trade, try to trade through it, as opposed to just shutting up shop. But what, what happened was that a whole, an absolute ton of day traders started buying uh, Hertz shares. And they went from uh, 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 56 cents on the 26th of May to Five euro fifty three on the eighth of June. Uh, wow! To the point that everyone was like piling in on them, like uneducated day traders. Like uh, Robinhood and TD Ametrade reported that over the course of that two week period, eight hundred thousand new accounts were opened across the two platforms uh, by new traders, retail investors, and like they were primarily pumping money into. Uh, car rental companies, airline companies, cruise companies, everyone that they that uh, was like had absolutely been screwed by COVID nineteen, and they were betting on them recovering. But people were just buying Hertz because it was cheap and it was going up. And Hertz were like they, they they saw an opportunity to to effectively say, well, we want to. They went to the court and asked, could they do a share sale to raise a, a billion dollars on the back of what's happening? And said, why not take a chance on it? But as part of the, the filing, they had to say that they required to state in full that you know these shares are likely to be worth nothing, which is just bizarre. It's it, I, I know it's absolutely ridiculous, and I'm trying to think of an analogy, but it's late. Yeah, you know, and it's something about a pizza shop closing down, and maybe I'm hungry, but um, no, I couldn't believe it when I saw it either. That how can you actually go out and raise money? And say to them, listen, you, you, there's a good chance you're not going to get any of this back because the senior bondholders are first. Oh, no, no. They didn't even say there's a good chance. They said you are all, all but certain to be wiped out. Oh, my God. Like, it's not, <laughs> and like, I mean, uh, yeah, credit to Hertz for saying, you know what, we, we could chance our arm here because obviously there's been a, a ton of money piled into them over that period. So they said they took a chance on something. Which, like, so fair play to them in that respect. Um, it, it comes back. To, it comes down to a far bigger story, which uh, we, you know we'll we'll discuss another day uh, when we see how it kind of plays out over the next couple of weeks. Which is partly related to the fact that because people haven't been able to gamble on sports, they've been gambling on the stock market. Yeah, and uh, so I, I have some really, we were chatting about it offline, and I I want to go into it in far more detail because actually it's a really interesting. There's a lot of really interesting characters in it, so we might keep that for another day. Um, but yeah, it kind of comes down to the fact that people can't bet on sports. 
it's incredibly easy, obviously, with new apps and uh, how well they're set up to just uh, trade on. Oh, yeah. I heard today that there is something like a 2,000 person waiting list to get a new account at Digiro, yeah. um, who are a an online broker, you know, low cost yeah. online broker here in Europe. And it, the guy that was telling me about it, um, and I don't want to mention him and <laughs> his name in ca- case the person who told him told him that in confidence. But anyway, uh, he was saying, at least I, I really don't know why this is happening. And, and, you know, it was trying to grasp at a few different areas, but you nailed it. It's because people can't gamble. Yeah. So they open trading accounts and uh, play the stock market, like we said back in, you know, 1986, whatever. Cool. Anything else going on that you, you thought was worth highlighting? Uh, no, I mean, they were the, to me, they were the main stories that I'd been looking at, some of the uh, kind of random collection of really interesting ones and really unusual ones. Um, what about you? Yeah, no, I mean, I, I, you know, like I said, I had been collecting stories since Friday, uh, and each one of them are interesting. But you know, some of these might be more interesting with a conversation with myself uh, than it would be out to everybody else out there in uh, in the virtual world. You know, what? What? Just to mention one that stood out is uh, that I, I've mentioned to a few folks, and this was quoted in Finextra uh, back uh, last week, last Friday, the twelfth of June, uh, that Brits go weeks without using cash during the COVID nineteen lockdown. Uh, it was an average of 44 days out of 2,000 people polled by Nationwide. And so, you know, that that they had gone without using cash. And nearly a third of them admitted that they don't even remember what they last bought with cash, right? I thought that was interesting. I don't think cash is going away, though. I think it's here to stay for a while. Um, it's just that, you know, society is changing in different ways, but um I was talking to folks over the last few days about different economies around the world um, that are still heavily cash dependent and will continue to be heavily cash dependent, regardless of what what's going on yeah, around the world. It's you know? an interesting one because obviously there's like to, there's been a forced kind of uh, rush to make everything contactless, um, and like I, I have ten euros sitting in my like in the kind of sleeve that my phone that I keep my phone in, uh, you know, the kind of covering or whatever, and it's been sitting there for months now. I haven't yeah. any reason to use it. Uh, and even like being able to up the contactless limits in the shops has meant that people are not carrying even larger notes. Like actually the first time I had to use cash in like like good number of weeks, I brought the kids to Donaghy Forest, which is near enough to where we are at the weekend. And it's five euro in coins. And you'd want to see the queue. There was about 50 cars. It was a really nice day there on Sunday afternoon or whatever it was. Thought we'd spin out because we'd been out there a few times kind of during lockdown when it was very quiet. Um, and we'd parked somewhere different. But today, we were, at that day, we were like, oh, we go to the car park. And the amount of cars that had obviously driven up to the thing thinking, oh, yeah, five euro is what it says. It doesn't specify in coins. Surely there's something to tap or stick your card into. No. And of course, it's one of those places where do you think there was room to turn your car around? So you just had this situation where there's like wow. 50 cars lined up and no one could turn or go anywhere else. Um, because it was coins and nobody had f- coins. I was yeah. a curse there because it actually annoys me how long I was sitting there when I think about it. <laughs> yeah, I think that's your first curse in, in 90 episodes. So it's yeah. about damn time. About damn time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so like, it, it, there's little things that happen, but actually that, that specifically, because when no, now going again, I, I found a lot of change in the house the other day. So I threw it into my car knowing that in case I'm stuck going out there or I want to go out there that I haven't done even enough to think about it. Uh, that's crazy. crazy. Well, yeah, it reminds me of so many other things. We could go on and on. Any interesting uh, books you're reading this week or, or things you've seen on TV? Uh, no, actually, no, I'm in a bit of a lull, actually, with books. I haven't got any. Me too. That uh, Chimp Paradox took me way too long to read, and the last third was really disappointing because it turned into be a self-help book, and I'm like, oh. I, I just flew right through that. Um, but uh, Dark on Netflix, been watching that this week. Really cool. Uh, it is dubbed from German into English, uh, but dubbing is done so well you forget about it. It's about this town in Germany and um, all this, you know, what do you call it? Not extraterrestrial, but supernatural things that are going on. And I won't give any of it away, but I will say they have broken some of the basic rules of time travel as proven in the Back to the Future series. Um, so that was, uh, but you know, it's really good. And you, you forget about the dubbing, which um hadn't happened to me in a very very long time so but it did good show dark on netflix i'll put it in the show you know, I, I was uh i was up late one of the nights i couldn't uh, couldn't get to sleep and i still got on wolf of wall street and it reminded me how what an, a fantastic movie that is ridiculous but actually such a great movie um, I, 
was not zero noise. I hadn't watched it in a long time now. But, uh, yeah. Yeah, we, we had something set up to talk for an intro to Jordan Belfort um, yeah. for this podcast. And it just, the guy just disappeared. Um, it was yeah. the FBI agent. What was his name? Um, that went after and got Jordan Belfort, whatever his name oh. was. I forget who it was. Yeah. Oh, God. Uh, I can't remember it now, actually. But yeah, we. Yeah. Oh, uh, well, yeah. Jeez, I hadn't thought of that, actually. I let it go. You know, it was an interesting introduction, but, you know, um, Never pursued it. Maybe I'll crack that can back open again. We'll see. I'll just, I'll just tweet him. It's worked in the past. <laughs> yeah, why not? Why not? Cool. All right. Anything else? No, no. It's what half 10 now on Wednesday. And I'm, I'm, my brain is getting tired. I don't know about you, but. Uh... I know. Yeah. I, we, it, it, we're getting into the silly time now. So, um, uh, you know, I mean, you know, I mean we alluded to it two weeks ago because, and then I got a text from a, a listener, a, go, a good friend of both of ours saying, oh, dude, do we have an announcement to make? <laughs> I think <laughs> I think he thought we both were moving job or something. <laughs> yeah, like, no, it's not that we. And uh, I mean, I'm happy to mention it that we're planning on launching a newsletter now in the next couple of weeks. We're still just kind of finalizing the, I suppose, the content to go out on that. But our our kind of weekly newsletter that we're planning on launching, Money Never Sleeps newsletter. Uh, so stay tuned for that. Absolutely. Next. Yeah, L- looking forward to getting that out there and just trying to do something a little bit different for the community. Right. And I'm not saying that from a ecclesiastical sense. I'm saying that from a, hopefully a literary sense. Um, and you know, if, if we can contribute in another little way to, to creating a distraction for folks, then, uh, well, hopefully informing them at the same time. And well, you know, that's the, it. Uh, you know, the, the, the point of this and even these money talks part, it's, it's the interesting stuff that we want to talk about, and go into a bit more detail on, but not just the uh, obvious, you know, oh, this is the, the story that's been in every paper sort of thing. It's the kind of unusual ones. And that's the kind of angle we want to take with the newsletter is, you know, here's something you may not have seen or may not have kind of thought about in any detail. And here's a bit of background as to why it actually is kind of relevant, and, you know, useful to know about Absolutely. Yeah. I, I, the, uh, opportunities are endless here to, uh, to create new strings that people can just dive down a rabbit hole with. Um, Actually, aside from anything else, I have, I, I have like a list of amazing stories and articles that I've come across over the years that I kind of go back to every so often that I, I, I tend to forget or whatever. And this, to me, this is just an excuse to bring some load back out. Like I, even, even when we're talking about that Hertz thing, like Michael Lewis has an article from, it must be like eight or nine years ago about a 13 year old who got fined by the SEC uh, for financial advice that he was giving out and people were investing on the back of his advice um, because he just set up a website. But all he was doing was copying what he had seen on uh, CNN and MSNBC and stuff. And I think he was up, like, uh, I think he made about a million and a half or something. And they tried to fine him and take it off him. And his argument was, but no, uh, he wasn't doing anything wrong because all he was doing was what the TV shows were doing. Um, It effectively got settled, but I'll, it'll be one of the ones that I'll definitely include in our first kind of newsletter because it's just a fascinating story. So it's stuff like that, which are kind of really relevant or some of them are coming back to being relevant now. We'll be like curators of fine wines. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. All right, bro. Listen, uh, great chat. Thanks so much. Yeah. We'll talk to you again next week. Yeah. Take it easy. Money never sleeps, pal. That wraps it up, folks. Thanks for listening to us. Try to figure out why the world does what it does. The links for the stories we covered are in the show notes for this episode on moneyneversleeps.ie, so check us out online. Remember, if you or a colleague need help attracting and retaining great talent for your fintech or financial services company, it's highly advisable that you build a relationship with the team at Top Tier Recruitment as they really know their stuff. You can find them at toptierrecruitment.com. Also, thanks to Conan Brophy from Create Sound for recording and editing this podcast. As for me, I increase the odds of startup success. Get in touch at Pete Townsend NV on Twitter if you want to know more. You can follow Owen on Twitter at Owen Fitzgerald9. Finally, till next time, thanks for listening. See ya. Money never sleeps, pal.